All right, listeners, welcome back to Sustainability Define, where Jay and I are still at it, defining sustainability one concept and one bad joke at a time. You've arrived at episode 44 on biomimicry. Jay, this is one we've been talking about doing for a while. I remember when we started and we were telling people, like, one concept at a time, we always threw out biomimicry because it's such a defined, important concept. It, it's literally in our teaser for the entire podcast. Is that right? and, and here we are three years later, finally getting to it. Wow. All right. Well, Jay, tell the people what we're going to hear about. All right, people, let's start. <laughs> let's start by asking what is biomimicry, followed by why should we even care about biomimicry in the first place? Then we'll ask what is the history of biomimicry and then look to examples of biomimicry in the real world. Then we'll ask how can organizations actually integrate biomimicry before then branching into our guest, Nicole Miller. That's a solid lineup, Jay. I've got to say so myself. <laughs> well, you know, we always start from the very basic, right? So what is biomimicry? At its core, biomimicry is an approach to innovation that seeks sustainable solutions to certain challenges by emulating nature's time-tested patterns and strategies. In other words, let's apply how nature approaches problems to solve our own. The Biomimicry Institute phrases it beautifully, uh, in our opinion. It says that the core idea of biomimicry is that nature has already solved many of the problems we are grappling with. Problems like toxic waste, resource efficiency, and others. Animals, plants, and microbes are the consummate engineers. After billions of years of research and development, failures are fossils, and what surrounds us is the secret to survival. I really I, like that failures are fossils. I was right just there. laughing at that. It's it's so blunt. <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Successes, they're, lo- they're we forgot about the successes. It's the failures. <laughs> Those are sticking around. So, but Scott, speaking of fossils, when you put all this into context and recognize that humans have been developing systems and tools for just a tiny fraction of all of evolutionary time, It kind of makes sense that we refer to nature for solutions to these problems that have been tested and refined over millennia, right? It's Mm -hmm. it's kind of wild to wrap your mind around that. So, all right, Scott, why don't you start telling us why we should care about biomimicry? Well, Jay, a whole host of reasons, and let's dive into some. For one, biomimicry helps foster innovation and disrupt traditional thinking. When designers are able to take a step back and consciously ask themselves, how is nature solving this particular problem. They grant themselves new brainstorming opportunities to solve challenges in new and innovative ways. Second, biomimicry can generate benefits for the community at large. For example, buildings, streets, and parks can be constructed to perform the same functions a natural ecosystem does. So it can help with smart cities and urban planning, to throw out some buzzwords. (laughs) Did I hear you say blockchain? Yeah, no, we got to work that in. We still haven't done an episode on blockchain. But. Oh, boy. What did I just do? We should. All right. So, all right. Number three, biomimicry could be big business. Terrapin Bright Green states that companies that leverage bio-inspired innovation, which is a synonym for biomimicry, can increase revenues, reduce costs, and meet global needs. They can also increase their environmental, social, and corporate governance rating, or ESG, which can attract investments from the $45 trillion managed by firms supporting this ESG trend in financial markets. I always get big numbers with the ESG these days, huh, Jay? Uh, it's, like, trillion. it's like, how, how are you going to wrap your mind around these numbers? But at the same time, they're important. Okay, so some more big numbers for you. By 2030, the Fermanian Business and Economic Institute estimates that bio-inspired innovation could account for approximately $425 billion of U.S. GDP and $1.6 trillion of total global output. That's $2 trillion stats we've thrown out, Jay. That's that's good. (laughs) Yeah, let's Um, deal with that. Right? Plus, bio-inspired innovation could generate approximately 2 million jobs by 2030. Not too shabby. We all love jobs. Mm -hmm. All right, Scott. We do have to note, though, that all of this progress is not going to happen magically. The vast majority of Americans, including company leaders and government policymakers, are not yet familiar with the idea of looking to nature to solve human challenges. So I would say, Jay, we're about five minutes through this intro. Stick with us, and you're going to be in the top maybe like 0.1% of Americans in the knowledge of biomimicry. So you can feel good about that. 
<laughs> the, or the, maybe not the, good because so many people don't know about it. The movement anyway. starts here, Scott. There you go. And finally, we should care about biomimicry because it's simply good for us on a personal level. By encouraging the study of how nature operates, biomimicry can show us how to embody resilience, how to adapt to different climates and contexts, and how to cultivate collaborative relationships. And Jay, I think we'd agree those are some pretty positive character traits we can learn from studying nature. Scott, I think we've been able to do all of those within the context of the podcast. Uh, I'd certainly say that we've cultivated a collaborative relationship here. And embodied resilience when our computers freeze wow. or our tech doesn't work, right? <laughs> Little did we know we were a walking example of biomimicry. We've had some close calls. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So with this to set the table, let's branch into the history of biomimicry. So turns out people have been looking to nature for answers for quite a long time. The best example we could find of ancient biomimicry came in the year 3 A.D., when a Chinese man named Lu Ban saw children using lotus leaves to shield themselves from the rain. He decided to mimic the flexibility and effectiveness of the leaf and create a product of his own. Drumroll, Scott. Mm. Oh, okay. <laughs> we can work on that. Yeah. The very first umbrella. Scott, fun fact, the first umbrellas were actually made of silk. They're probably worth a lot more back then. Yeah, then could sleep on that thing. <laughs> In 3 AD, I wonder if Lu Ban was friends with Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> let's let's go with sure. Why not? Yeah. Uh, so fast forward, Jay, about 1,500 years, and we arrive at Leonardo da Vinci and his Da Vinci Code. Of his <laughs> many areas of study, he was especially attuned to biomimicry in his study of birds. He was fascinated by flight and drew out schematics for many flying machines that mimicked the bone structure of birds and bats. Then in 1955, we have one of the most famous applications of biomimicry that really put the field on the map. While hunting in the Swiss Alps with his dog, George de Mestral noticed that burrs, which are those prickly things that you find when walking through tall plants that kind of like stick to your socks and stuff. Oh, yeah. We've all been there. Right? So he noticed that walking through the woods, these burrs stuck onto his clothes and his dog's fur. After examining the burrs, he noticed that its surface was made up of many tiny hooks. They stick to things by intertwining these hooks into the loose makeup of surfaces like fabric and animal fur. He then invented Velcro by mimicking the surface covered in tiny hooks and pairing it with a surface covered in tiny loops, which led us to the most epic kids' shoes of all time. I mean, I had them, but I think also Epic were those shoes where every time you stepped, the lights in the back went off. Yeah, those stride shoes. Can you imagine a stride yeah. shoe with Velcro that lights up when you walk with it? Yeah, uh, that'd be <sighs> sweet. Almost as good as a silk umbrella. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and it was also in the 1950s that the term bioemetics was coined by American biophysicist Otto Schmidt. After several decades of refinement, the term biomimicry appeared as early as 1982, and was finally popularized by the renowned scientist and writer Janine Baines in 1997 in her book, Biomimicry, Innovation Inspired by Nature. So, okay, Jay, let's get into some examples of biomimicry in the real world. All right, so examples of biomimicry can be found almost everywhere, but let's start with one that harkens back, Scott, to our last episode on high-speed trains. Mm -hmm. Oh, so topical. In the late 1990s, Japan implemented biomimicry in the form of its trains. The bullet trains they had been using were causing problems for nearby residents. When the train zoomed through a tunnel, air would compress in the front of the train before releasing a tremendous booming noise once the train exited the tunnel. The chief engineer was able to solve this problem by looking to one of his hobbies, birdwatching. The kingfisher is a small bird with a long beak that dives into the water for its prey. The engineer redesigned the front of the train to be shaped like the kingfisher's head, resulting in the train slicing through the wind rather than trapping it inside tunnels, thus fixing the booming sound. Mm. And let's keep with uh, the wind here, Jay, and let's talk wind power. Uh, the one flaw in wind turbines is that when placed too close together, Turbulence disrupts and lowers the efficiency of traditional wind turbines. When studying the way schools of fish swam through water so close together, researchers noted that how the fish swam complemented each other and none of them missed a beat. 
hence making them very good dancers. <laughs> this helped to solve the wind turbine flaw. When they rotated the axis so it pointed vertically, the turbines could be placed much closer together without disrupting the others. This increased efficiency by up to 10 times compared to the more traditional horizontal version. You know, Scott, people might think fish aren't good dancers because they don't have legs, but au contraire. <laughs> I think there was a Finding Nemo scene with that, right? <laughs> and finally, a quick callback to one of our earlier episodes on the circular economy. This notion of an economy with no waste also incorporates biomimicry. Waste doesn't exist in the natural world, and we're seeing more and more companies look to eliminate waste in their operations. That's right, Jerry. So these companies that are looking to do this, how can they actually integrate biomimicry principles? A fantastic and kind of a lofty question, Scott, but here comes the Biomimicry Institute to I believe the in rescue. you, Jay. You can do it. Thank you, Scott. And I'll do so with the help of Janine Bainus, who we talked about earlier. She's actually the one that, number one, popularized the term biomimicry and co-founded the Biomimicry Institute. Mm. So... Crucially, this Biomimicry Institute developed their Biomimicry Toolbox that lets anyone integrate biomimicry into their work. They have a great graphic that summarizes their biomimicry design process. This graphic is, of course, shaped like a conch shell from nature, and it starts mm -hmm. as a wide spiral before tightening inwards towards a solution. Brilliant. So let's it, right. So let's run through the six steps of this conch shell in the process. Okay, Jay, so the first thing we got to do is define. We have to clearly articulate the impact that we want in our design to have in the real world, that basically the challenge we're trying to solve and the criteria and constraints that will determine success. Then we move on to what I believe is a made-up word, <laughs> biologize, <laughs> where we analyze the essential functions and context that our design solution is meant to address. Then we reframe that in biological terms so that you can, quote, ask nature, end quote, for advice. For example, you could move from the design question, how might we keep buildings cool in the summer, to the biologized question, wow. how does nature regulate temperature in hot climates? Number three is discover. Look for natural models, like organisms and ecosystems, that need to address the same functions as your design solution. Identify the strategies used that support their survival and success. Number four is abstract. Carefully study the essential features or mechanisms that make the biological strategies successful. Restate them in non-biological terms, such as, quote, design strategies. And, and Scott, I'll note, in its toolbox, the Biomimicry Institute notes that this number four abstract step is one of the most difficult of the design spiral. So why don't you give us an example to help put this all together? Right, so the first part of the example was about the biological strategy that was successful. And here we have the polar bear's fur. It has an external layer of hollow, translucent, you know, kind of not white guard hairs that transmit heat from sunlight to warm the bear's skin, while a dense under fur prevents the warmth from radiating back out. Okay, so that's our biological strategy that was successful. Now we need to restate it in more general, non-biological term. So you could say that same sort of approach like this. A covering keeps heat inside by having many translucent tubes that transmit heat from sunlight to warm the inner surface, while next to the inner surface, a dense covering of smaller diameter fibers prevents warmth from radiating back out. Scott, I... uh, it's, it sounds technical when I say it, but <laughs> it's meant to be more general. Never just sound more like an engineer. It is, it is quite thrilling, Scott. Uh, yeah, well, don't get used to it. All right. So number five, we have emulate. Look for patterns or relationships among the strategies you found and hone in on the key lessons that should inform your solution. Develop design concepts based on these elements. And finally, number six, we have evaluate. Assess the design concept for how well it meets the criteria and constraints of your design challenge and how it fits into Earth's systems. Right, and when you're evaluating, you want to consider technical and business model feasibility. Your product can't just rely on a link to nature. That's not sufficient. It has to be competitive in the marketplace. So you want to refine and revisit the previous steps we went over as needed to produce a viable solution. So the six steps we went over, Jay, define, biologize, biologize. discover, yeah, discover, abstract, 
emulate, and evaluate. So, Jay, we've gone through biomimicry now. People are experts, especially compared <laughs> to the rest of the population. How? Uh, tell us about our interviewee, Nicole Miller. All right. Nicole is the managing director of Biomimicry 3.8, which is a certified B Corp and social enterprise. Biomimicry 3.8 is a leading bio-inspired consultancy offering biological intelligence consulting, professional training, and inspiration. Right. And prior to joining Biomimicry 3.8, Nicole was the managing director of the Montana World Trade Center, where she worked to increase global business opportunities for Montana companies. Also in the past, Nicole was director of international sourcing for Overstock.com, where she built the global sourcing division from scratch, basically going around the world, seeing who has too much stock, I guess. Much much <laughs> like scavengers in the wild, Scott. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. There's All right, no Jay, waste well, in let's, nature. Let's go to Nicole and hear more about her expertise in biomimicry and how we can benefit from it. All right. All right, Nicole, thank you so much for joining us now uh, on the podcast to talk a little bit of biomimicry. It, as we said, it's a concept that we've been wanting to talk about for a while, so it's great to have an expert like you on the show. So thanks so much. Yeah, thanks for having me. And we talked a whole bunch at the top of the show about biomimicry, so our listeners are prepared now to hear more. And the first thing we want to ask you, though, is how you got interested in this topic. You know, did you come across it in a textbook? Did you... Did someone just talk to you about it? What what happened? How did you even hear about this thing? Yeah. Well, I think there's probably two parts to that answer. I think, so I grew up in Montana, which is nature is a way of life here. It's kind of how we operate in terms of like recreation and life. And nature is just part of everything we do. I also spent much of my childhood on my grandmother's ranch. So I also witnessed and experienced a life that is dependent on nature. So subconsciously, I think my upgrade upbringing likely laid the foundation for later in life when my career kind of intersected with biomimicry was really through my work as a sourcing director at Overstock. And I think like a lot of people who got into sustainability, they came through the lens of compliance. So my job as director of sourcing was to really oversee the the environmental and social compliance of all the products that we were directly sourcing. So all our private label goods. Yeah. And so for me, it was like, okay, right. There is, because as your average consumer, like when you buy a product, you have like the slightest, I think most, I'm broadly generalizing here, but for the most part, you're not thinking about what material is this? Where would it, where was it made? Who made it? You know, what are the negative kind of externalities of this supply chain? Like you don't think about that when you're purchasing products. So for me, kind of being privy to that process of like, oh, right, okay, there is much bigger layers embedded in this whole kind of notion of consumption. And that was kind of a big uh, aha for me and a big light bulb that turned on. So Nicole, you touch on this and it, it segues perfectly into our next question. So, so much about this sustainability movement is catalyzing change in the way things have been done for a long, long time. So the question is, how often do you face skepticism about this concept of biomimicry when speaking with businesses that have operated a certain way for a good amount of time? You know, do you find that folks are willing to explore opportunities or, or maybe are they more hesitant to think about those kind of valuable business slash design lessons that can be extracted from nature? One, I think anytime you're talking to businesses about change, that's always difficult. So like if you're talking about the fact that a product they, that they might make or a process that they use is fundamentally toxic or harmful. So having that conversation is always difficult, right? And I think they know this, right? That's oftentimes why you're having that conversation. So I think the what is helpful for companies and what, what I think is powerful around biomimicry is that it comes from a place of of example and hope, right? Like, so our name, Biomimicry 3.8, the 3.8 comes from the fact that there's 3.8 billion years of R&D in nature that we can lean into and and really kind of helping people understand that um, this isn't new. It's been done for a long time. Um, So really trying to figure out like what are their fears and anxieties around, you know, this kind of methodology and really using 
science-based historical factual examples to kind of help them see this is a methodology and tool to achieve the goals that they're looking to achieve. There's actually a study that was done um, by Dr. Julian Vincent and his team. And what they did was they overlaid the human patent database with all the solutions in nature. I'm oversimplifying this broadly, but essentially they overlap the two and they found a 12% overlap. So what this tells us hmm. is that of all the, the patents that we've filed in, in, in the human patent database, we're only touching 12% of what nature has innovated around. Like, so, so there's like 88% solution space for us that we, that's untouched. I almost thought the number would be lower. Oh, you know, yeah. When you think about all of the innovations of nature, I don't know. Well, I think that, you know, that's a good point. I think part of it is we only, we un, we only understand a small portion of it. Mm, okay. Is there, well, is there an example that you are not bound by an NDA or that you can share more of that you kind of always like to turn to and illustrate for people of the power of your work and biomimicry in general that you want to walk through with our listeners? I mean, the one that we are often associated with a lot is Interface. They, we've worked with them for over 15 years now. Um, but essentially, our team helped their carpet designers look at carpet design in an entirely new, new way. So they manufacture carpet tiles. And when their designer, their head designer, David Oki, went out for a walk in the, in the forest with some of our biologists, they essentially identified that on the forest floor, there was no like structured pattern, right? It was just this unstructured pattern that existed with, you know, leaves and colors and patterns that didn't have linear lines. And essentially what, what that launched was this line of, of their product called Entropy, which is now 30% of their sales are a billion dollar company. And this line, Entropy, what it what it did was enable them to create carpet tiles with random patterns. So, for example, when you spilled on one particular carpet tile, you didn't have to find that exact carpet tile that you that you spilled on. You could just insert any carpet tile and it would still work. Right. Mm-hmm. So that's kind of the, the, the foundation of, of that design. And that really opened the door for Interface and their um, kind of relationship with biomimicry as an innovation tool as well as a strategy tool. Um, and that's led to some of our most current work with them around this project we call Factory as a Forest, which is essentially helping Interface design their manufacturing centers to function like the forest next door. To me, the more exciting part of that journey is that they started with this question of, you know, how would nature design a carpet tile? And that led them to a new product, new product category, which then opened the door for an entirely new way of thinking within their organization. And I think that's the bigger win there is that that kind of shift in design thinking and strategy within the company. It sounds like, Nicole, you're suggesting that listeners in their day jobs can say, you know what, I'm going to go out and and walk through the forest for a while and they can still bill it as working. (laughs) Exactly. Well, what's your takeaway? That's, uh, (laughs) (laughs) yeah. And so Nicole, one, I have a couple questions. One is first, do you know of any companies that have biomimicry people in house? You know, like their director of biomimicry. Just curious. Yeah. Oh gosh. I wish there was a director of biomimicry. Wouldn't that be so cool? Yeah. Well, we do. So part of our company trains people to do biomimicry, right? So we have a whole training program. We have a partnership with Arizona State University where we deliver master's degrees in biomimicry. So those people go on to be oftentimes to be biomimics in an organization. So Johnson & Johnson, um, one of our people is embedded within Johnson & Johnson. I would say very rarely do they have like you know, biomimicry in their title. Yeah. They're typically, you know, in the space of innovation, they're in the space of sustainability, but like head biomimic is, is kind of not in, in their title, but head absolutely. Head biomimic. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, but they absolutely go on to be working in the industry and applying the work. Okay. So maybe I'll just go off what you're saying. So the, 
tell us more about this training program. Like if our listeners wanted to do this, could they do it? Absolutely. Yeah. So what's involved? Well, I think it depends on what your like kind of like interest and capacity of commitment is, right? So as I mentioned, the the ASU program, that's a two-year program, but you might not be ready for that. Maybe you just want a one-week immersion in biomimicry, which that's where a lot of people start. Um, or in fact, you could even, we have a whole resource section on our website, biomimicry.net. We have a, I mean, you can read Janine's book. You can, we have a resource handbook, which kind of teaches you the design methodology and how you can, you know, all the case studies, several case studies and examples and how you integrate that. Okay, and when we talk about the power of biomimicry, you were talking about an example with the uh, factories as force. Can you expand upon that? Uh, maybe just a minute here. Yeah, yeah, I'd ha- I I love this work because it's um it's it's probably mimicking nature at it at 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 the kind of most complex level. Um, so when we talk about biomimicry, you can you can mimic form. That would be like mimicking you know, a sunflower, like the, the shape of a sunflower and the Fibonacci sequence, um, of, of a sunflower in, in like how you design an urban space. Um, right. So that's like the shape or you can mimic process, which would be mimicking photosynthesis, right. In solar cells, or you can mimic systems, right. Like ecosystems. You can, un, you can mimic like how that whole ecosystem is connecting and providing services and benefits to everyone within that system, everything within that system. So factory as a forest is really kind of emulating, uh, it's the latter, right. It's emulating a system. And we do this by measuring how, a forest functions. And, and it, it could be, it could be a desert. It could be, um, essentially what we're doing is we're taking the wildlands, a high performing ecosystem, an existing high performing ecosystem in relative close proximity to a facility. We're measuring how that high performing ecosystem operates in terms of how much carbon it sequesters, how much biodiversity it creates, how much soil it's generating, right? So we're, we're quantifying the performance of that, of that high performing ecosystem. And then we, and then we quantify the performance of the manufacturing site or the building site. And what we do is then compare the two and we and we look at that performance gap of, okay, well, your site is omitting carbon and the, the forest is sequestering carbon. Are we talking about a forest that's right next to the factory? Like, so you're saying, like, is that why you're comparing the two? Well, it's, it's metaphorical, right? So you're saying that the factory is functioning like a forest. So it's factory as a forest, um, is, was this particular project name with interface, but it could be data center, like a desert, right? Like essentially what you're doing is you're, is you're taking your, your facilities and you're comparing it to the local ecosystem and you're identifying the performance gap between the two so that you can create design interventions so that your facility is functioning like the ecosystem next door. I think the biggest part of it, Scott, is really the the fact that we're using performance metrics to drive change and we're using performance metrics based on science based on high performing ecosystems instead of these arbitrary numbers, right? So instead of saying we're going to reduce our water goal by 30 or our water consumption by 30%, we're saying we're actually going to reduce our water consumption by 80% and filter water at the same time because that's what the forest next door is doing. And if we are going to operate in a world that is truly sustainable, we should be delivering ecosystem services at the same rate as a healthy forest next door. Right. It's like forest-based goals instead of science-based goals, almost. Well, I mean, they're still science-based goals, but they're based on okay. living ecosystems, sure. right, versus just kind of arbitrary numbers that we think are important. Excellent. So th- thanks, goals. Yeah. So, Nicole, transitioning now, are there any drawbacks to applying biomimicry or are there any wrong ways to apply it from your experience? Yes. I mean, you can do biomimicry with toxic materials um, or in siloed <laughs> that process. That good. <laughs> yeah, but, but you can. I mean, we've seen that done, right? Like, so you could, for example, like you can emulate spider silk, which is 10 times stronger than steel using materials that are carbon or water intensive or worse toxic. And you've mm-hmm. just lost that opportunity to create a more safe and innovative material. 
right? And in the, in the same context, like you can look at a challenge in a really siloed way. And I think this is where people kind of fall short. You, you could absolutely do biomimicry in one piece of it, but if you're not looking at the whole system, if you're not looking at all of it, you, you really lose that opportunity to, to create systemic change. Very cool. So almost systemic, not only from an environmental perspective, what are our inputs, what are our outputs, but also systemic within the organization itself, making exactly. sure that these, you know, these quote in-house biomimics are not just spinning their wheels and that they're actually, you know, creating that systemic change within their company as well. So our listeners might now feel like, okay, biomimicry can solve a lot of our big issues. And some might, because we talked about how there's not too many jobs around biomimicry in the title, but they want to incorporate it in their jobs and in their lives. What are some sources people can go to to learn more and educate themselves on this topic? Yeah, um, there's a lot and it's growing every day. So our organization, Biomimicry 3.8, our website is biomimicry.net. And if you go to the buzz, uh, we have a whole resource section. So tons of available, like we've got a design lens, design methodology, everything that we create is creative commons. So you can download it. It's free all there for you to use. Um, our sister organization, Bio, the Biomimicry Institute, sister nonprofit, they have an incredible tool called asknature.org. So if you wanted to understand, you know, how does nature thermoregulate or do heating and cooling, you could look there and there's a whole library of organisms that will teach you amazing things that you never knew existed. So that's an incredible resource. Um, as I mentioned, ASU, this is on our website too, our master's degree program. We have a blog called synapse.bio, which has some really great information and new content and references and lots of downloadable material. Another one I really love, which is just beautiful in design, is um, Zygote Quarterly. Uh, which is a publication that really integrates biomimicry, a lot of examples, a lot of applications, what's happening in, in the world of biomimicry, and it's visually stunning as well, is also a really great resource. Excellent. And so, Nicole, I think we have arrived at our final question for you, which comes in the form of a party fact. So if we are at our next party and we're hanging out, over drinks, and we want to share some kind of party fact about biomimicry, some stat, some very illustrative fact about the field that would cause folks to just you know, lose their minds. This stuff is so important, so cool. What might that party fact be? So I live in Montana, but I love the ocean, um, and I try to get to the ocean as much as possible. So one kind of cool party fact is around starfish, and that they have what's called a reversible adhesive. So Common starfish are found in sea surface, like down to the depths of like 200 meters in the ocean worldwide, right? So as they creep along the bottom of the ocean using like 15,000 tube feet, one cylindrical tapering arm leads the way, right? And the other kind of four curl back waiting for their turn. So super staying power is important for the starfish mm -hmm. survival as they move and, and stick to substrates while being bombarded by the ocean's currents. So they make a glue to stick to the substrate. Then a second material instantly is created to then unstick, leaving behind kind of the stick fo footprint on, on the substrate. Mm. Um, so, it, so it's got this ability to kind of like create a glue to stick and then instantly unstick, right? So it, it can kind of create that charge to, to adhere to a substrate and then like kind of let go of it. Right. So think about that. If like you were this human, right. If you could like walk up the side of a building wall, like if you had like gecko sticky feet and could like release, or, um, if you could create this material that bound when you need it to, and then like could instantly release it when you didn't need it anymore. Right. So this kind of attach detach. So this is like super cool mechanism that the, you know, the, that you just think about like starfish and like the glue on their feet and like the reversible glue coming out, you know, next. So that's kind of a fun one. And, and I'm curious, are there, 
you know, biomimicry applications of that that you're able to see right now? There's a lot with, I think, more with geckos and what's called the Van der Waals forces, which is like that ability to kind of stick and, and unstick, uh, which is slightly different from what the, the starfish does. But an, an actual product in a glue, no. But I challenge a company to do that because that there would be go. amazing to have a material that would allow us to kind of stick and unstick instantly that was non-toxic. Where, where usually it get people get stumped and get tripped up is they're asking the wrong question, mm. right? So, so it, to, for biomimicry, t- to actually use the biology, you have to break it down to a function, right? So we wouldn't say, you know, how is Apple going to design the next iPhone, you know, and say, well, how does nature create an iPhone? We would say, how does nature geolocate, right? Geolocation is the, is the function that we're looking for. Got it. There's all sorts of examples of geolocation in nature. Um, but there's not examples of designing an iPhone, right? So we have to, we have to get the the question right, which is understanding the function. So with the starfish, you know, it might be, um, adhere, we might be looking at examples of adhesion or, you know, but you wouldn't naturally just like start looking at starfish, you know, for different design ideas, but you, you'd want to understand like, what is the function that we're trying to solve for? And then that leads us to the, to the right biology. Well, nature missed a pretty big business opportunity there. <laughs> <laughs> so there are kind of do, two different approaches to biomimicry. You can just be a really brilliant biologist and see different ways in which the the business world needs these applications and start to create those. Or you can have a really specific challenge and, and start to look to nature to see, well, how does that solve that and use that as um, the kind of solution space for thinking differently. Excellent. Well, Nicole, thank you so much for taking the time to join us and share all these really visual and illustrative examples of biomimicry that listeners should not only be able to learn about, but hopefully see from themselves out as they're walking around. So thanks again for sharing your wisdom. And we look forward to seeing where Biomimicry 3.8 goes in the future. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And and, um, I appreciated all the jokes. (laughs) (laughs) We don't hear that all the time, Scott. (laughs) Thanks, Nicole. (laughs) Bye. All right, Scott, much like snakes shed their skin from time to time to make room for a new skin, fresh skin, so too must we shed our skin of this episode and start preparing for the next. Mm, but now we have gross dead skin. But nature, <laughs> nature leaves no waste, so I'm sure <laughs> something will be able to come take care Somebody of Somebody will take care of this for us. That's Great. Right. So, Jay, let's thank some people here. Let's thank Square Peg Round Hole and Potions for our music. Let's thank my mom, who has become basically our, our star researcher here. So she came up with some really good stuff for the episode. Samantha Birch and Annabelle Mercer, who are continuing to help us with our marketing strategy. And then Matt Ahrens, who is killing it on social media for us. Listeners, a reminder to rate, review, and subscribe to our show on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Uh, Scott, you know, I'll, I'll share with listeners, we're a little disappointed. Uh, we did not have any new... Reviews come in over the last yeah. month, but uh, we are going to whip out an old one, but a good one for you to enjoy. So ATXM, who wrote this review from the good old US of A back in March, said, I've been trying to educate myself on sustainability, and this podcast has been really helpful. Hearing about what's happening and what's next in sustainability allows me to feel hopeful instead of paralyzed by waste climate change and resource distribution atx we are pumped we can do that for you well said and please do take a minute uh, you can do it within the pod apple podcast app to review us it helps us get showing to people when they search for things like sustainability and nobody took us up on it last month so good chance that we'll read whatever you put down there uh, if you take the time <laughs> so please do that and jay i think that about does it You all stay sustainable out there. I'm Scott Breen. And I'm Jay Siegel. We will see you next time.